General for Fairfax, Mr. Plum. Mr. Speaker, I rise for a point of personal privilege. The gentleman has the floor. Mr. Speaker, and ladies and gentlemen of the House, I rise today to express concern that Governor McDonald's proposed budget shortchanges the children of our Commonwealth. I know the hype going around that the governor's providing 500 or so million new dollars for public education, but if this claim is true, why are school boards and superintendents around the Commonwealth talking about the cuts in programs and, te and teachers that what they will need to make because of the loss of state funding? Well, the answer is complex, but one that we as legislators must understand if we're going to give meaningful consideration to the governor's proposal. From FY 2007 to the present, there's been a $1.4 billion reduction in education funding. At the end of this biennium, school systems will be getting $500 less per pupil than they were just four years ago. Now, if these numbers are correct, how can the governor claim he's increasing funding for public schools? Well, the answer is down in the weeds of school funding formula. And if you will bear with me for a couple of minutes, I'd like to walk you through an explanation of how this happens. Every two years, the formula for funding schools is adjusted in a process called rebenchmarking. It's the process is put in place to ensure that the formula reflects the realities of school population increases, inflation, standards changes, and other factors. Except for this year. This year, we only partially reimbursed re benchmark the formula, and the result is that we have made the school cost of schools appear artificially low. The cost left out of rebenchmarking includes some inflationary costs, federal funds, and costs to compete. Some inflationary costs were left out of setting the base formula for school funding, even though schools have seen insurance premiums go up by nearly 9 percent, gasoline for buses by a third. And, local and localities are now paying about 9 percent more for their electric utilities. If the bu governor's budget is approved as submitted, localities will have to pay these inflationary increases without help from the state. This change results in $109 million in cost shifts to localities. Now, in the, re in the re benchmarking process, the use of federal stimulus funds in 2010 and 2011 to offset the lack of state funds in those years is now being subtracted from the calculation of basic funding, thus penalizing school divisions for the state use of federal monies. Again, this subtraction makes the cost of operating schools appear to be less than it actually is. Now, I'm well aware of the fact that we've had to deduct for federal funding for a number of years. But in those instances, we were talking about deducting federal monies that was over and above the cost of basic education. Now we're deducting the very federal money that we used to balance our budget in past years. Doesn't make any sense to me, and what it does is it makes education appear less costly. These changes result in the base cost of schools to be artificially low. It is this low number against which the governor is said to have increased funding for education. That's why the governor can say he's providing more money, but school boards and superintendents are saying they will need to cut teachers, increase class size, and reduce programs because of his budget. According to press accounts, Augusta County is facing a $4.5 million shortfall, Charlottesville $4 million, um, Virginia Beach $49 million, Norfolk $20 million, Suffolk $6 million, and Portsmouth $1.8 million, among others. In order to calculate the benchmark for school costs without the arbitrary adjustments made by the governor, the Appropriations Committee staff kindly calculated for me that an additional $99.2 million would be required in the first year and $100.5 million in the second year to correct the arbitrary changes to the funding formula. I hope the Appropriations Committee will take these amendments into account and put that money back because it's the money that we're shortchanging our children. In an analysis done for, for local governments to determine how much local governments would have to increase the, pro the property tax in order to make up for these changes, it is estimated that half of local governments will need to increase the real estate tax by at least two cents, and many will have to increase the real estate tax by five cents. As I've asked us before in past sessions, don't go home bragging about we haven't raised taxes, because, ladies and gentlemen, we don't fully fund this formula for 
public education, our local citizens won't let the quality of public education go down. They'll make up the difference, and they make up the difference by raising the property tax. We'll be responsible for that increase. On top of these changes, the majority of new dollars in the governor's budget goes to repaying the VRS for monies previously borrowed and not to the classroom. And local governments are going to have to increase their contributions to VRS further, and that will further limit the money that goes to, into the classroom. The Commonwealth Institute measures our state's declining support for education another way. The Institute found that investments in education have fallen from two and a third percent of personal income in FY 2007 to roughly two percent in the next biennium. That's a sizable amount of money. Keep in mind that Virginia is the eighth wealthiest state in per capita income in the nation. Yet our per pupil spending from state sources is 35th lowest in the nation. Our average teacher salary is $4,500 below the national average. And at the end of this biennium, we'll be running our schools on $547 less per pupil than in 2009. $540 less per pupil than in 2009. We already have 2,116 fewer teachers and 45,000 more students. Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen of the House, I think the evidence is clear. We're shortchanging the children of the Commonwealth in their education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.